All right, good afternoon and welcome to the second module for the CCI Clearance Preparedness Program. We appreciate you all taking time to be here today. I'm just going to kick off some um, today with some housekeeping, item, um, housekeeping items for today and for future modules. If you have registered, you do not need to register again for future modules. Please sign into the Zoom modules with your first and last name. There might be someone else with the same name as you, and we want to make sure you receive attendance credit. Having said that, we take attendance every single time. Zoom webinar documents the date and duration of your stay on the module. You do not need to email me after the module to tell me you attended. If you are having Zoom issues, I sadly cannot help you. Please contact your institution's IT department. Um, however, if you are calling in and I see phone numbers instead of names or nicknames, you will not receive credit. I will try and message you um, and the group to identify you, but unless I know who is participating with the full first and last name, you will not receive attendance credit. If you ever have a question regarding your attendance, you are able to um, reach out to me. I've sent you guys numerous emails, so I know you guys have my email by now. Lastly, students will only receive a digital badge certificate if they complete eight to 10 modules. The next module will be scheduled April 3rd from 1 to 2 p.m. So with that said, I will turn this over to Dr. Eric Berger to kick off today's module and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Kendall. Uh, and uh, welcome to uh, the next uh, unit of uh, clearance readiness. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the clearance paperwork process, uh, but first, just a reminder of uh, the cool places you can work with a clearance. They can be inside, they can be outside of government. Uh, we gave uh, last time a very broad overview of the clearance process. And in a sense, uh, we're gonna uh, drop you into the very deep end of the clearance process, which is the dreaded SF-86. Uh, basically, you know, we went over last time that the government is trying to decide if you are reliable, trustworthy, of good conduct and character, and of complete and unswerving loyalty to the United States. So how do they know? They ask. Uh, and basically, you'll fill out a form, which uh, we're going to uh, talk about in detail for the next hour. Uh, you'll often have a personal interview, uh, and depending on the agency and depending on uh, what you're uh, going to have access to, you might have a, a polygraph. So with that, I would like to uh, introduce Mr. Timothy Leak, uh, who is, is uh, going to really help out on, on this. He's uh, really been around this topic for a while. He's been involved uh, in research compliance for over a decade uh, at Virginia Tech. He's also our contractor special security officer. And in this case, the contractor is us, Virginia Tech as a contractor to the government, because as we talked about last time, uh, it's the government that does the clearance, not uh, the company or the university or whatever. Uh, and he's also responsible for all aspects of industrial security for the university. Uh, and I can say as a fixed wing pilot, I'm in awe of our rotorcraft brethren. Uh, Mr. Leake served in the US Army for over two decades in various aviation command and staff positions. Uh, he was not just flying desks, but uh, also flying Apache, Kiowa, and Huey helicopters uh, in places like Alabama, but also uh, having leadership positions in Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom and in Germany. Uh, since we are academics, you know, he does have a bachelor's in economics from Towson University and an MBA from Radford University. So, Tim, is it time for you to get your PhD? Uh, anyway, I'm going to uh, stop the share here and uh, let you take over. So with that, Timothy Leak. All right. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. Very kind intro. Uh, yeah, we used to, my son's in the Air Force flying jets, and uh, I always tell him that uh, rotary aircraft uh, are different than jets because we beat the air into submission rather than just fly through. So... Uh, I, I, a couple, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and share my screen and bring up the slides. Um, oh, host has disabled participant screen sharing. So, oh, let's see. Can I deal with that, or Kendall? Can you deal with that? 
Yeah, if you guys got the copy of the slides I sent you yesterday, I've got them up. If you can just share your, you know, give me screen share. I think I just did it. So can you try again? Yes, ma'am. Yep, we are in good shape. And let me know if y'all can see that okay. And here we are. Yeah, there we go. And we've got your PowerPoint version. Yep. Okay, fantastic. Uh, a couple of admin things here. Uh, I'm pretty uh, open if you have questions, uh, either to hop on and ask them at the time. You know, let me finish the slide, but if it's pertinent to that slide, it helps us stay on topic as well. If you want to type them into the chat, and if Kendall or Eric, if you'll let me know if there's a, a, a chat question that comes up uh, at the end of each slide, uh, we can address it right at that time while it's still pertinent, rather than wait to the end and try and figure out where it was in the, the question arose in the, the process of the screen. All right. So uh, we want to first kind of lay out at Virginia Tech, the Office of Export and Secure Research Compliance. Uh, we do many things for the university to uh, ensure that we're following all the governmental rules. Specifically, um, we have an export control and sanctions. You'll see that as the first pillar. Um, they deal with ITAR, EAR, uh, foreign persons, uh, foreign uh, PhD students, uh, all that kind of stuff. The second pillar is the research security. So when you think of research security, in this case, for us, it's all of the um, IT and computer requirements that the government puts on us in order to be able to comply with government regulations. And the third uh, pillar there is industrial security. That's kind of where I live. Uh, and that's where you know, we deal with uh, personal security clearances, uh, classified contracts, uh, DD-254s, all of the guidance we get from the government, including um, making sure that we comply with all of the rules, regulations, um, in order to be able to conduct work in the classified arena. So where does it come from? Where does it start? Uh, at the National Industrial Security Program Operating Manual, or the now, you know, this short called the NISPOM. Uh, it, it actually really all started back in the 1940s uh, during World War II, where we had a realization that we needed to uh, protect certain information for national security. Um, followed up over the years uh, through uh, multiple executive orders from uh, the president, um, and as amended, you know, the original you know, EO 8381 was issued by FDR in 1940. Well, that has been amended, and there's more executive orders that have been put out over the years that form the basis of the National Industrial Security Program. Um, interesting uh, history, if you ever wanna sit and read some of those executive orders, specifically if you have problems sleeping at night, those will help you get through that, but you can dig through that and find out some of the back spaces of it. But we're gonna talk about specifically things that are happening currently as of right now. Um, one of the historicals is uh, there is a security management system that was in place that controlled all of uh, submitting for security clearances, and you'll hear it as J-PASS. It was an Air Force program that was adopted by the industrial security uh, complex in order to be able to process people for security clearances. Um, that has now transitioned to um, a system called DISS, D-I-S-S, uh, and that will get more fear in the next year or two uh, to a, a system called Envis. None of that really matters to you all because that's what the security guys use in order to be able to submit for clearances, excuse me, process those clearances, and it also keeps us the ability to manage your clearance after you have already been indoctrinated and given your clearance level. Um, as of uh, April, August 24th, 2021, the NISPOM was uh, codified into CFR, uh, 32 CFR Part 117. The importance about that is, is now it's a federal regulation which is enforceable by law. Before, 
It was directives, policies, and procedures. Now it's a regulation. So that's, that's pretty important. The second part is it also incorporated the Security Executive Agent Directive, or a SEED 3, which clearly defined reporting requirements uh, for those that are cleared individuals and additionally um, enhanced the 13 adjudicative guidelines that they use uh, in order to be able to adjudicate each individual based on the whole person concept um, for being able to um, meet the requirements that Dr. Berger talked about in his first slide about, um, you know, being of character and uh, allegiance to the United States. That's what the SF-86 does. Um, the industrial security letter they talk about there for C-3 was incorporated, so that's not a, um, that's, that's not really an important bullet anymore. There will be a couple dated things in here that I'll point out as we go. <coughs> But if you want to, you can go to the new NISPOM. You can look through it and read it, um, as well as that DCSA letter, uh, if you're looking for more information on how the NISPOM and the CFR Part 117 uh, actually implement some of these things that we will be discussing today. Okay. Probably the most generic but most important slide in, in this entire deck. Um, I've talked about it many times. Uh, I'll have people come to me and go, hey, I want to get a security clearance. Well, it doesn't work that way. Um, you can't go and get, you know, like a, a TSA, um, you know, being able to get on a flight easier. It's not something you can do. What needs to happen is um, it starts with a classified requirement that has, or a classified contract that has a DD-254, which lists the security guidelines um, that would authorize you or authorize us as security to submit your packet to be able to get cleared to be able to work on that classified program. So in the process of doing that, uh, security as we, once we have that, we'll have a program manager or a uh, primary investigator uh, will shoot us a note and basically say, I have this contract, I have this program, <coughs> And I require these individuals to be cleared onto that program. That is the authorization that allows us to begin the process. The first part of the process will be, we're going to send you a standard release of information as a document that you'll sign that basically says, we're allowed to use your personally identifiable information in order to be able to begin the process of getting your clearance started. The second thing that we will most likely send to you, and this is, pretty much across the board. It's not required, but it's how Virginia Tech does it. And I'll, I'll tell you that many um, industrial security companies out in the industrial security complex will do the same thing. So release of information, author you authorize us to be able to use your information. The second part is we're gonna send you a pre-screen questionnaire. A fairly generic document, uh, but what it does is it asks specific questions. Are you a US citizen? Um, have you had a clearance before? Do you, uh, at, and they'll list several different questions. You know, if you had any uh, issues with uh, being arrested or having an alcohol-related incident, uh, any drug use, uh, just to go through, and it's a pre-screen to ensure that, you know, we're not starting a process that um, we're going to end up getting, you know, time, effort, and money involved in something where, we have an individual that will never be able to get a clearance based off of past history and, uh, and issues. So we will get that started. The second part, once we get all the way through, we get you in doc. Uh, the security guys will ensure that there's, you, know, you have the appropriate clearance to be able to work on a program, to go to meetings um, at a certain level, depending on what is required. The second part of this is the government uh, Contra uh, let's see, contracting officer's technical representative or the program security officer, uh, they will be the ones that authorize the need to know. So clearance level plus a need to know for the information will give you access to that classified information material uh, and be able to work on a classified program. So I hope that that kind of lays out the initial portion of it. Um, 
of how this will start and, and how you'd be able to get to a point where you would be um, have the ability to start the clearance process. Are there any questions so far? Is there any in the uh, in the chat room? Yeah, there aren't, and uh, that's the only way they can do it is through the, the Q&A. Oh, okay. All right, so classification and marking. So, and you'll, you'll hear people talk about SCI and SAPs and some other stuff. Uh, that's all in addition to these three basic levels of classification. So, uh, depending on the level of your program, whether it's a confidential program, a secret program, or a top secret program, that would be uh, how we would start the initial process in order for you to be able uh, to work on one of those programs at that level. So confidential, um, if compromised, confidential information would cause damage to national security. And it will grow as we go from confidential to secret to top secret in the amount of damage that the information, if compromised, would cause to national security. So secret, serious damage, top secret, exceptionally grave damage. So you can see how it, it graduates from uh, one to two to three. Okay, and the tiers, the OPM, um, Office of uh, Personnel Management, they run their investigations based off of the level of what we need to do. So tier one, non-sensitive, low risk, um, physical or logistics asset, that's an SF-85, much less invasive form, uh, asks much less questions uh, than your SF-86. So tier two, same thing, still a non-sensitive, moderate risk, a public trust. Uh, well, they'll go into your background to make sure that you know you have met the minimum requirements of a tier two. Tier three does use the SF-86 form, and that is for confidential secret or in the DOE world, an L classification clearance. <laughs> now this, uh, the next one is uh, really the tier five. That's for critical sensitive position requiring top secret or SCI or a Q level DOE level access clearance. Um, once we get into SF-86, um, you can Google this form, you can pull it up, you can see what they're gonna ask you. Um, it's a fairly invasive form because they're going to ask you, uh, you know, basically about the last 10 years of your life, um, but nothing before the age of 18. So if you're 25, you got to go back seven years. If you're 30, you got to go back 10. Um, and, you know, they're going to ask for dates, times, locations, people who knew you at those locations. Uh, they're going to ask for three people who know you well. Um, so you need to clearly go down and, and understand that you're going to have to um, compile a great amount of information uh, about yourself and your family uh, in order to be able to complete this form. So initial clearance application, it does use the standard form SF-86. Uh, it's Googleable. it's out there. Make sure it's at least the 2016 version. There are multiples before that. Um, every agency appears to do this differently, but if we're just talking about um, the DOD and uh, TS clearance, you will most likely always use um, what they call now the EAP program. Uh, it has replaced EQIP as of October of 23, um, and we use it pretty, uh, you know, most of the time, uh, you know, seven to 10 times a month. And what we'll do is we'll start with that uh, release of information in that pre screen. Uh, we'll have validation that you are going to be working on an, an active uh, classified contract. And then we'll begin the process of sending you, getting you into this, into EAP, and send you an email that will say, please click this. It'll take you to the EAP program, and then it'll walk you through the SF-86, which does have the capability of you can start it, you can save it, and go back. Uh, you have pretty much 30 to 45 days to complete your SF-86 application in EAP. Um, and there's a, the second bullet there talks about, depending on the agency, 
Sometimes you're required to use, um, you know, a certain version of the form and submit a hard copy, but that'll be on a case by case basis. So what I'm going to talk about today is really just the EAP process and how it is going to how you would interface with it. Uh, it is a, a very good program uh, in that it, it will ask you after during each section, do you have anything more to add? And you'll allow to add something in where in the old hard copy one, you'd have to um, you know, stop at that point and then go to uh, a follow on copy and then, you know, basically continue to put in, you know, if you've lived in 25 places in the last 10 years, um, it's, it's significantly painful uh, where if you do it through the E app, it's going to allow you to just keep going down the steps. Uh, so, yeah, Tim, we do have a question. Uh, okay. And, you know, a lot of these sections are, have you ever, have you in the past 10 years, have you passed seven years? Uh, what about, you know, for when you were younger than 18? Would it be asking for, for stuff uh, from, from before you were 18? No, they are not allowed to ask for anything prior to your 18th birthday because you're technically not a uh, adult, considered uh, legally an adult until after 18, uh, as far as this form goes and the, and the government regulations. Okay. So there is yeah, there is one place where they will, and it's like education, and that's only if you have like if you're and we do have some people uh, on on in the webinar that are. Uh, uh, at community college. And so if you're 19 years old, they ask you for your education going back at least two years. And that's like the only time that I'm aware of where then you would you know, have to say where you went to high school or you're homeschooled or whatever. Correct. And, and what I normally tell people, they'll come to me and say, hey, uh, I have this. You know, it said the question said, have you ever? Um, my answer to them is uh, you don't have to prior to 18. But if you believe that, you know, it, it, in full disclosure, you can provide that information prior to 18 if you believe that it is something that could cause a problem during the investigation itself. So um, I always go with full disclosure because they're going to find out anyway if there's something that, that is dark and ugly in your past. Uh, be upfront with it, own it, and uh, put it on your form. Um, but uh, there's no legal requirement prior to 18. Um, and if it if it if you don't put it down and during the investigation, the investigator will you know, have an interview with you so that he can go back and he can ask questions along those lines. But um, it's always better to be upfront on the forms um, so that uh, it doesn't require that much in-depth questions from the investigator during that interview. Yeah, and another one, you know, kind of at the, the other end is, mm -hmm. you know, you're changing careers, you're 50 years old. Uh, so clearly, you know, have you in the past 10 years, have you in the past seven years? That's pretty obvious. Right. Uh, what about the have you ever's? Have you ever's are exactly that. It's have you ever been arrested? Have you ever been, you know, um, brought up on criminal charges? Have you ever uh, been denied a clearance? You know, those... Those type things, you know, you need to be able to put those down there um, and even with the resolution. And I'll talk in a little bit about uh, the continuous evaluation through continuous vetting um, portion of where they, they move to now uh, on how they maintain your clearance after five years. But I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, but yeah, as, as far as have you ever, that is, uh, is have you ever. <laughs> it's uh, Good, Thank you. Yeah, it's hard to get around some of those. All right, so some of these, you know, these are all the sections of the SF-86, um, and most of them are, are pretty self-explanatory. Um, name, date of birth, uh, contact information, what is your current stuff, passport information, what is your citizenship, do you have dual citizenship? Where it gets difficult is where you get into where you have lived, where you went to school, your employment activities, um, and the marital relationship status, relatives, foreign contacts, foreign activities. Um, so in the sections where it, you, know, you have to go back 10 years, where you live, where you went to school, your employment activities, the biggest problem we see in there is that there are holes um, where you know, 
let's say you know, where you have lived, uh, you, you missed a year. It needs to go back and it needs to not have any drop. So it should be like August of, or let's say currently March of 2014 um, or August of 2023 to the present. And then, you know, uh, July of 2023 back to July of 2022, there cannot be any dates, you know, any holes in there. Uh, where you went to school, uh, those, uh, you know, you can list it out to all the way back to high school uh, if you want to. Uh, you don't have to go past, you know, back prior to 20, uh, your 18th birthday, but you can if you want to. Employment activities, this is another one where it becomes a problem, especially for students where you're a student, uh, you don't have a job, you're just going to school. Uh, that would have to be listed as unemployed. Uh, so every month, you have to have where you're listing your employment activities, whether it's uh, you're an RA at the school, you worked at Dairy Queen, or you know you were an executive at an industrial, um, you know Lockheed Martin. Uh, you need to make sure that there's no gaps at all in your employment activity going back seven or ten years, depending on whether it's a secret T three or a TST five. All right, so um, farther on down the list. Marital and relationship status. Um, they're asking, I want to say probably in the 2016 version, before they just you know ask you about if you were married. Uh, now you'll find every one of the uh, questions related in this section is uh, if you have a, um, if you're married, if you're uh, in a relationship, uh, you have a cohabitant, uh, it's, it's basically, they've looked at it from a perspective of, um, they're looking at anyone that would have the ability to have uh, some type of influence on you making a decision um, that would be contrary to, um, you know, supporting your clearance requirements that you, when you get in doc, uh, you know, you basically say that you're going to protect classified information you've been exposed to, you're going to report it if you find in the public domain and then pre-publication review of any documents. And you'll have a service requirements of reporting uh, foreign national contacts and foreign travel. So marital status and those that if you have a cohabitant or someone that is endeared to you um, that can influence you, uh, even though you don't have a specific relationship with a foreign national contact or a foreign national person, your spouse, cohabitant, uh, your significant other may, and if they have a, a bond of affection with that individual and a bond of affection with you, they can influence you. So those get a little bit more uh, in-depth when they start talking about uh, marital relationships. Uh, it'll also ask about your relatives, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, stepbrothers, stepsisters. Um, as you can well understand, they're going to ask you for dates of birth, places of birth, citizenship, um, anything of those nature. So that's another area where you're going to have to um, talk to these individuals and get some information that you may not readily know. Um, additionally, I'll tell you on anywhere where you list somebody um, on your SF-86, uh, I highly recommend that you make sure you contact them and tell them, hey, listen, I am doing a... Uh, a, uh, a application for clearance for national security, and you may get a call from um, a, an investigator uh, relation in in re in relation to that if they have any questions of you uh, in the course of the investigation. And the reason I say that is uh, um, there was one that they told us about uh, several years ago where um, they. Uh, an individual had to list his grandparents because both of his parents were deceased. They listed their grandparents because they were um, the ones who pretty much raised them. And they lived out on a farm in Kansas. And in order to be able to get the questions answered for the investigation, they sent a sheriff out to the farm. And the grandparents were uh, highly dismayed. They were concerned. What did he do? What happened? Is he in jail? Uh, and caused a lot of consternation and upsetness. Um, so please make sure you tell folks that you're going through the process and you may be contacted 
by um, an investigator, a, a federal agent, or a sheriff in the, pro in the through the course of your investigation. Um, a foreign contacts and foreign activities. Um, we'll talk a little bit more on the next couple slides, but um, you know they're getting more and more detailed. Uh, specifically asking about social media contacts. So there is a concept of close end, close end or continuing, as well as a concept of arm's length. Um, so foreign contacts, um, close and continuing, it means that you are either you in a continuing um, a relationship with someone where, you know, you meet every two weeks, every month, um, or Close is you are bound by affection um, or some type of a uh, relationship where uh, it is more than just a casual friendship. Um, foreign activities, what they're talking about there is, um, are you associated with anyone that, that has um, organizations that are headquartered outside of the United States um, that are not particularly advantageous to the security uh, of the United States. Uh, foreign travel, that's pretty simple. Anywhere outside of the United States, um, that includes uh, Canada, Mexico, uh, the Virgin Island, or the, uh, the Bahamas. Um, that requires a 30 days prior to foreign travel, submitting a foreign travel form advising uh, the government that you are traveling outside of the United States. Um, and the rest of it, the, the physiological, police record, illegal use of drugs, use of alcohol, um, uh, financial record, those are all designed to determine, uh, you know, in the whole person concept, um, is there any concerns as far as your character, um, those additional things where you, if you have any illegal use of drugs or use of alcohol, um, you can be used against you in some type of a... Um, a method that would cause you to do something you normally would not do uh, in relation to protecting classified information. Um, <clears throat> I have a slide a little bit further. It talks about the 13 adjudicative guidelines. So I'll hold it off on my next comment until we uh, we get to that slide. So we do have uh, <clears throat> two questions. Okay. Uh, one of them is... Uh, no, let's say if you have a question in the past 10 years mm -hmm. uh, and you had, you know, trouble 10 years and one month ago, mm -hmm. do you put it down? If it was, have you ever? Uh, and normally... No, no, it's, it's a, it, if it's, because clearly if it's have you ever, then you've ever. Right. But, uh, and in fact, that's important uh, for the first, because they didn't phrase it quite this way, but... If it says, have you ever, ever means ever. ever. Correct. But what about, you know, for the ones that say, you know, in the past 10 years, have you, and it's 10 years in a month? Um, and that that is, again, I go back to, um, it's best to be upfront on anything that, that you could cause concern of you getting through a clearance. Uh, if you put it down, um, then they'll have it up front, and they'll probably, you know, resolve it in the adjudication process. Uh, if you don't put it up and it does come up during the investigation, it will most likely um, cause your investigation to take much longer to be adjudicated because you didn't raise it and tell them prior to. So uh, technically, do you have to? No, it's past the 10 year mark. Um, is it prudent to do so? It may be. Um, it's, but again, I, I always tell them it's better to be um, open and upfront with anything that could cause um, concerns or delays in your clearance process. And this is an opportunity, as you've said, and when, you know, hopefully you all will have the opportunity to uh, fill this out online. Uh, there's a place for, you know, any comments. And you can say, you know, I answered question 20B2. Yes, it was outside the 10 year window. I thought you might be interested. I've not been involved with whatever that activity is since. And you know what? Probably they'll go, yeah, whatever. But yeah, if they find out 
about something that was really material, you know, it could take longer. Would you have a case to, uh, you know, if they denied you on that, would you have a case? You might, but who wants to get the lawyers involved in all that? So good thing. So another question is, uh -huh. uh, and this is like generic. I fill it out online. I press send. I press sign. And then I realize, oh, my goodness, I made a mistake. You know, kind of what happens then? Well, what what will happen then is, yeah, you've submitted it all. I mean, and, and here's a funny one. Um, you know, my wife had a clearance as well. And she was going back through her at the time called a periodic review. Every five years, you had to submit another SF-86, um, not just changes, but a full one that takes you another five years into the, uh, you know, into the future. But she had forgotten to list my youngest son. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so the, the investigator had called her and doing her interview. Uh, you will have an opportunity to, to at, right, you know, during that interview say, hey, you know, after I submitted it, you know, I realized I a forgot this, or b um, I, I didn't really think of it in the context, but I believe now this is reportable, or I should have put this on my SF eighty six. So you have that opportunity to go back and make sure that your record is straight during that interview with the investigator. So actually, while we're on family, uh, this is mm -hmm. a, a, an interesting question. So you know, what if you are eman emancipated as a teenager? You you know legally no parents no siblings what do you do well i'll be honest with you eric i've never run into something that, i mean they everyone matriculates from somewhere <laughs> so um uh, there, there would have to be something but if you are um you know on a ward of the state um then you would you would list that as you know and then you would if you hadn't you know you obviously you would think that you would have been adopted so you'd have your adoptive parents um you know each of those one-offs like that that would be something that would work significantly with that individual to make sure that we're sure that <laughs> that they're they're putting down as much information um as possible to be able to uh help streamline the uh the investigation to uh, its hopefully fruitful end of being in docked and being able to have an active clearance. That's great. Thank you. Okay. So doing pretty good on time. I want to make sure we get through this. So the clearance application states, I already kind of talked about this before. There has to be a programmatic need that would authorize you to even be submitted for a clearance. Um, we determine the, the level of the clearance based off of the program. Uh, if it's a secret program, you'll do a T3 and, and we'll, you know, push ahead to get you a secret clearance. If it's a TS or higher, we're going to get you a TS, per, uh, TS level clearance and we're going to submit a T5. Um, so you complete the SF-86, you submit it to an agency, the government begins the background investigation. The first thing you'll see uh, to know that you, the government has started your investigation is they will pull your uh, credit report. So if you have freezes on your credit reports, uh, TransUnion, ex, you know, Experian, whatever those, all the four are, you need to take those freezes off so they'll be able to do that. Um, Good scary now, news. Good scary news on that one. What's that? You don't have to anymore. What's it's that? just scary news because it means they can reach in even if you have a freeze. Oh, right. Yeah, <laughs> I, you're right. I did hear that they don't require you to take the freeze off anymore. Um, and that is scary because now they can get in there. But that's part of the continuous vetting process uh, that I'll talk to in a second. Uh, thanks for that uh, catch there. Good catch, Eric. Um, so the investigation will close. The results will be sent to an adjudicator. So you'll get a investigation close date that will show up in DIS and then soon to be ENVIS, which is that you know government um, system of record for clearances. Uh, and then it will pass to the adjudicator. And the adjudicator will you know, basically resolve any eligibility issues um, or not. You know, so it's either the eligibility is approved or it's rejected. 
and it's approved uh, based off of the 13 adjudicative guidelines. And I'll come back to this here in a second. Uh, so the 13 adjudicative guidelines, um, you can Google these as well. This is uh, part of uh, the C4, uh, which uh, it goes hand in hand with the reporting requirements of C3. But as you go down the list here, you'll see it lines up almost, you know, specifically with sections of the SF-86. Um, and they're going to resolve any, you know, concerns in each one of these areas based off the whole person concept. So <laughs> let's say drug involvement, um, you know, especially right now with uh, uh, marijuana being, you know, legalized by the states at the federal level, it's still an illegal, considered an illegal drug. But they're also starting to minimize the impacts of what this would have on your ability to get a clearance. Um, they still want to see something that says, you know, the last time I used, you know, X drug was when I was in college. Uh, now I'm married. I have two kids. I'm in a different place in my life. That's one of the adjudication processes they'll go through. Um, and just like uh, the old saying, time heals all wounds. Time distance between a certain event and, and today while you're submitting it always makes it better. So um, they'll go through these adjudicative guidelines that will resolve any issues um, to get you to a point where they can resolve your uh, eligibility issues. Um, I will tell you, a lot of people are concerned about um, lifestyle and how they do stuff. I will tell you, across the board, investigators and adjudicators really don't care a lot about, you know, lifestyle issues. They care if that it's something that uh, you want to protect so much uh, that you want to make sure that you do not, uh, it doesn't become public knowledge. Anything like that would give foreign intelligence service agents, uh, blackmailers, uh, hackers, anything like that leverage in order to be able to make you do something that you normally wouldn't do under normal circumstances. So that's what they're looking for as far as, um, you know, your, your character across the board. <laughs> now, if you go down this list, you'll also see several, you know, terms where they talk about lack of judgment, questionable judgment. Um, it's all about, you know, your character, and your allegiance to the United States and your judgment um, in how you handle uh, life events. Now, let me step back one slide here and talk about the use of social media. This has gotten um, a lot more emphasis over the, the past five years, where they will now look at your social media um, you know, aspects and your accounts on web-based, uh, you know, software and uh, things like Facebook, uh, Twitter, Snapchat, uh, you name it, they, they, can, they will look into these things uh, for behavior and conduct, conduct that would be concerning under the uh, 13 adjudicative guidelines to be able to ensure that you are deemed um, having the character to have access to classified information. So, any questions on that? We can talk about that in a moment. Uh, continuous vetting through continuous evaluation. So as I was talking about, uh, it actually started in about uh, 2011. They started realizing that um, if you had a TS clearance every five years, you had to create another SF-86 and submit it, and it would go through an investigation process um, to where inevitably it would close and you either would have continued access to classified information or they would find things that were reportable events that you didn't report during you know, the time period before. Um, then <clears throat> if you had a, a secret, it was 10 years. Well, with new people, they used to call them dual tracks, but individuals that never had a clearance before. And then you had single tracks where people that had a clearance um, and they were doing a uh, periodic review after their five or 10 years, they were getting so backed up, they couldn't get through all of the investigations. 
So they came up with this idea of continuous evaluation through continuous vetting. Um, continuous vetting is a process which they have access to all kinds of, of databases, um, uh, judicial, criminal, financial, um, medical, mental, um, across the board. So what they'll do is they'll take your social security number and they'll run a vetting process through all of these databases they have access to, which will show that if you had a court appearance, it will show up in that vetting. Um, and then they'll go back to your file and say, did they report this, this court appearance? If you did, yay, good job, gold star, you're good to go. Um, if there's any discrepancies, they will contact normally your security officer or you directly and say, hey, we did this vetting. You had these events take place, but you never reported them. And it'll give you an opportunity to say, uh, yes, I did or I didn't. Uh, this is why. Um, and then you go through that process of adjudication again. Um, and what it did was it did two very important things. One is it lessened the impact on the investigation. So we're getting people um, who are doing their initials through the process a lot faster. But the second part is, is they're finding where people had not reported the fact that they had gotten a DUI to their security officer and for it to be vetted. Uh, adjudicated and determine whether they should have access, continue to access classified information or whether they should be debriefed. Um, when they first ran this, <coughs> there's about 4 million people in the United States uh, working either in the industrial security complex or with the government that have a clearance. Of that 4 million, they got, they processed maybe a third of that through continuous vetting. And they found uh, somewhere on the order of 8 to 15 percent of that initial one-third of four million people had a life event that was not reported uh, as required by uh, your NDOC requirements when you say you'll report these things that take place. Um, so uh, now it's, uh, you know, if, you, if they do a vetting and you had a life event, uh, you were arrested, you had went to court, uh, you had a financial issue, you claimed bankruptcy, uh, you had a windfall, won the lottery, or uh, received over $10,000 in one shot without reporting it, um, they will now have the ability to come back rapidly, uh, well within that five-year period or 10-year period before where you get a periodic review. Um, so it did streamline the process. It does do several things that allow uh, individuals to remain in evaluation. However, you will be also still required every five years to submit an SF-86. It just won't initially um, be put into an immediate investigation process. They will use the vetting process to do that. Any questions on that? Okay, so here's kind of how it is. Here's the process, you know, automatic database checks like I was talking about. Um, it'll go, uh, alerts are verified, no action required. Uh, there are events that show up that weren't reported. They'll mitigate and monitor uh, and or they will revoke your clearance for the future. Tim, I got a good question here from the audience. Uh, what's the grace period? I mean, clearly the sooner is the better, but uh, <laughs> how long typically before, like if I did something and I got to call you up? Well, again, yeah, you're right. Sooner is better, sooner is harder. Uh, but, you know, you pretty much know the day after that uh, you're released from uh, the police station and were charged with a crime. Um, you know, that, that the soonest you can put that in there, even though it's unresolved. I, you know, here's one where um, an individual went down to the Mardi Gras and he was, you know, a mid, middle aged guy. Uh, got caught doing something stupid on the streets down there in, in uh, New Orleans, got rolled up, uh, was arrested, thrown in the tank, then taken to the judge the next morning. And the judge goes, what are you doing in my courtroom? You know, you're, you're, you are so, you know, you're not a teenager, you're not a college student, you know, get out, pay your court fees and don't show up in my courtroom ever again. Well, he was like, whoo, that uh, was all thrown out. 
No, it wasn't. There was a arrest record. There was a judicial court record. You showed up in court. No, no matter what the resolution was, it was still an event. You still have to report it. <laughs> so yes, um, if as soon as it happens, you should you know initially say it, and then you can go back and put an, an update to your thing. Well, it, I went to court and it was thrown out as a domestic dispute that uh, was resolved and there were no charges. Yeah, that's fine. You still need to make that initial report. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is generic. This is, you know, some of the reporting requirements under C3. You'll see under the top secret and the other side. Um, <clears throat> and, I, and I don't really like this slide very much because if you have a secret clearance and you have a change in marriage and cohabitation, you know, you, know, you got a foreign national roommate, those still apply. I'm not sure why they put this out saying that, um, you know, the other six or seven things on the on the right side under secret, um, I would tell all of my cleared employees, whether uh, they had a secret or a TS clearance, you should report all of these as per the C3. So uh, that is the last slide. Is there any additional questions? We're right about 10 minutes left. Um, well, actually, there's a, a good question here. What, what about the other way around? You know, clearly, if you're in a domestic dispute and mm -hmm. a restraining order is put on you, that's a judicial result. You have to report it. What if you're the other party? What if you've uh, you know, gone to court to put a restraining order on someone else? Report it. And they have it. You know, it's bound. Yep. yep. Keep that yep, person. Absolutely in. report it because... Uh, you know, it'll still come up as, you know, you are in a judicial, you know, there's a judicial um, hit underneath of your name, uh, whether, you know, and you, you have to go to court because, uh, you know, someone hit you in a car accident. You know, you got hit. You're, you know, you didn't do anything wrong, but you've still been called as a witness into court. That's still another reportable event that you can... Yeah, you, know, you can say, yeah, I, I have to go to court. I'm going. I was called as a witness um, to this event. Um, this is why I'm being called. So it's always better to be upfront with it, um, and it, it you won't even know that it happened because the vetting will go through and they'll say, yep, they reported it. There it is. We don't have anything to be concerned with uh, adjudication purposes because it's not on that individual. They're there being called as a witness. So. Um, it's always better to report um, anytime you have any, you know, if, you, if you're going to, um, you know, VDOT or Department of Transportation to go get a, a, a new driver's license, we really don't care about that. Or if you get That's pulled right. over for speeding and it's not uh, considered uh, reckless driving, it's less, there used to be a monetary idea of $300 or more, you got to report it. Um, even though you know, that's, I would still recommend having that as a threshold. Uh, I've had people come to me and go, yeah, I got a ticket for, you know, running a, a stop sign or running a red light. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I hate it for you. Pay your fine. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> it's not a reportable event. So, but what I also tell everybody that, uh, you know, that are, that are cleared employees that I'm managing their clearance, if you ever have any doubt or question. Give me a call. Shoot me an email. Shoot me a Teams message. Hey, you know, I, I, I don't know if this is reportable. And then we can talk about it. Um, and here's the thing. You contact me and we determine that that's not a reportable event. And they run a CV and then they, they contact me and say, hey, we had this event show up. And I said, well, they did report it. They reported it to me as the security officer, but we determined that it did not meet the threshold so we didn't report it into their official disc profile. That still counts as the individual has reported the event and it now becomes a hit on me rather than on the individual who's cleared. Great, so I got another, uh, another one from the audience. Um, uh, I mean, I know the generic answer, but I was wondering if you've <laughs> experienced it, which is, you know, someone does have a criminal record I, and mm -hmm. presuming it's not a serious one. Uh, but they've got, you know, some criminal background. 
can they get a clearance or is it like, yeah, no, don't bother? Well, and that's that is the initial part of the PSQ that I look at. Um, you know, is it a you know, we have a requirement to gatekeepers, all security officers that will be submitting personnel security clearances. We have a requirement as gatekeepers to make sure that we're not wasting valuable resources and money. Um, however, I will tell you, I'm not an adjudicator. You know, if there's something that puts down, um, you know, I will say, yes, you know, go ahead and we will submit it unless I, it is so egregious, you know, that, you know, the, I'm still in prison right now. And I'm, <laughs> you know, that, that's a no brainer, you know, or they put on something like that is, you know, and I, I love smoking uh, heroin and I'm going to continue to do it to the last of my dying days. I will most likely not recommend submitting that individual for a clearance. Uh, but for the most part, I'll tell you that I'm not an adjudicator. I will talk to the program manager and the program investigator. I can't talk specifics, but I will tell them uh, the odds of this individual getting cleared are not very high. You might want to consider getting somebody else cleared in order to be able to fill that position on your program. However, we will still submit it. I've seen somewhere I submit it and be like, there's no way that this guy is going to get a clearance in the next five years. And 18 months later, it came back and said, yep, you're cleared to the secret level. So and that's, a, you know, again, a message that I've been putting out. It's always facts and circumstances. It's, yes. It's about, and, you know, you, the applicant. And again, yeah, you know, if you were arrested for marijuana possession, uh, you know, seven years ago and have been totally clean and teaching uh you know non-drug use to teenagers and all that you, you well depending on the agency if it's the fbi the answer is still no but right. other yeah, agencies yeah. yeah yeah and it is agency specific and what you're cleared for uh but just because you you know had you know we all had uh a yeah. Youth, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah talk with your FSO. yeah yeah yeah, I mean, everyone experiments, they all, they, and, you know, here's the thing, I tell folks, life happens, you know, no one anticipates they want to have any of these, these bad, you know, life-altering events happen in their life, but, you know, much like, uh, much like insider threat, where we're trying to identify individuals that might, you know, be doing things they shouldn't be, um, you know, most of the time we do investigations on insider threat where people have said, yeah, this guy's having concerning um, actions. He's doing weird things. He's staying at work late. Um, you know, he's, he's really, you know, he's not himself. He was dapper Dan, never a hair out of place. And now he looks like he comes into work sleeping in his clothes. We've done the investigations. We found out, you know, life got in the way. They're going through separation or divorce. They've got a sick kid. They had to put their parents in assisted living facility. Um, they're not, you know, the, life is, has dealt them some, some challenges. Same thing with the adjudicative guidelines and getting a clearances. Um, we understand people are humans. We're going to make mistakes. Question is, where are we now uh, as opposed to when that event took place? And that's the adjudicators that figure that out based off the 13 adjudicated guidelines. That's right. And uh, we are, you know, for people in the audience, we are going to go over in detail those 13 items uh, next month. Uh, we do have three other questions that we will get to, uh, you know, over the course of uh, the rest of the program. Uh, but uh, Mr. Leek, thank you so much for, for your time and insight and experience. You know, I've only seen myself and people who work for me You've seen a lot more uh, and have a lot more of the uh, practical knowledge. Yeah, and it's, so, it's yeah. just over time. That's right. So with that, you know, what's coming up? Uh, well, look at that. Next month, uh, government agency clearance rules and regulations. Uh, you know, where, where does all this come from and what are the nitty details? And that will get into, someone asked a question of how far back will they look at finances? We'll look a little bit about that. Uh, a deep dive on drug use, because that is, uh, especially around marijuana, a thing that uh, can potentially trip a lot of people up. Uh, we're going to look at cybersecurity authorities, you know, especially since this is the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative. 
uh, you know, the subtitle of that is who are you going to call? You know, what agencies have what authorities? Uh, and then, you know, a whole, you know, because as Mr. Lee pointed out, uh, social media is such a thing. Uh, we spend a whole field. A module on it. It's a big minefield. Uh, and then, um, you know, sort of the carrots, uh, some people who want you to work for them, you know, either uh, for a contractor on classified projects or from agencies that are, are looking for cleared personnel. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, hand it back to Kendall, but I want to, again, thank Mr. Leek and thank you all for uh, your perseverance in taking the program. Kendall. Thank you, Mr. Leek, and thank you, Eric, for joining us today. Um, that sums up the module for today. If anybody has any questions, please send me an email. Other than that, we will see you April 3rd. Thank you. Thank you.